to show you some things that I don't think you even knew existed. It goes against everything Manifest Destiny teaches about Native Americans. And I want you to know this part of our history because people erased it. And we'll get to that later on in the program. Erased it intentionally. Program. Erased it intentionally. That's an important part of it. Again, in the book, Discourse on Evidences of the American Indians Being the Descendants of the Lost Tribes of Israel by M.M. Noah, 1837. The Indians, like the Hebrews, speak in parables of their dialects. There is no doubt that the Algonquin and Huron are the parents of 500 Indian tongues. They are copious, rich, regular, forcible, and comprehensive. And although here and there strong Hebrew analogies may be found, yet it is reason to suppose that the Indian languages are a compound of all those tongues belonging to the various Asiatic nations through which they pass during their pilgrimage. Before we continue, I just wanted to emphasize what he said about the, uh, you know, the languages having, you know, so many similarities to the Hebrew and how Algonquin is one of the parent languages. So I wanted to show you this. So I wanted to show you, uh, for example, in this book I found here, it's called Antiquities, the first book of the New English history. So they're talking about New England up there in, uh, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, um, Vermont, New Hampshire, all that area up there, right? New England. Uh, all right. So just wanted to go to this page real quick. So they get there. Uh, this part of the book, they're talking about a place called Nahum Kik, Nahum Chik or Nahum Kik. All right. Of which place I have somewhere met with an odd observation that the name of it was rather Hebrew, Hebrew than Indian. For Nahum signifies comfort and cake signifies haven. In our English, not only found it an haven of comfort, but happened also to put an Hebrew name upon it, for they called it Salem, for the peace which they had and hoped in it and so it is called unto this day so you see salem actually was an original hebrew uh, vibration which sounded like nahum cake nahum cake which meant comfort haven comfort a haven of comfort a salem a, pl a place of peace all right and remember this area is algonquin languages all right so I have another example here. This is in another book. It's called A Key into the Languages of America or a, a Help to the Language of the Natives in that part of America called New England, right? So Algonquin, together with brief observations of the customs, manners, and worships of the natives, all right? So in this area, right? So this is written in 1643. The other one was actually from 1709, I believe, I have to tell you. All right, it's a little blurry here, but I just want you to see. So it says, first, others and myself so the, he has he goes through a lot of points so right away in this book his first point of, of what he wants to say about these indians he's encountering these algonquin speaking indians right says the first others and i and myself have conceived some of their words to hold affinities with the hebrew 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 secondly they constantly anoint their heads as the Jews did. All right. Thirdly, they give dow dowries for their wives as the Jews did. All right. So this is just another example. And this is from an original writing in 1643. All right. So let's continue with the other book. Returning to discourse on evidences of the American Indians being uh, descendants of the lost tribes of Israel by M.M. Noah says here, firmly as I believe the American Indian to have been descended from the tribes of Israel and that our continent is full of the most extraordinary vestiges of antiquity, there is one point, a religious as well as historical point in which you may possibly continue to doubt amidst almost convincing evidences. If these are the remnants of the nine and a half tribes which were carried into Assyria, and if we are to believe in all the promises of the restoration and the fulfillment of the prophecy. This is one of the earliest maps that we found on the Newark earthworks. This is a drawing by Weyrich from 1860. 
David Weirich had done the first comprehensive surveys of the magnificent Newark earthworks. The first of what came to be known as the Holy Stones was found there, and five months later, at the Jacksontown Stone Mound a few miles southeast of Newark, he found something even more amazing. Now they found one major earth structure in the center, surrounded by 12 small burials. David Weirich went straight for the middle one with nine other gentlemen, and they began to dig that mound down. And they uncovered it. When they did, they found a wooden coffin made out of oak. And opening up that coffin, in there was a large skeleton of a man, but also in this coffin was a little box, uh, no more than maybe about eight or 10 inches in size, and it was cemented shut. Wyrick and the men, while they're all there together, they pried this box apart, and in it was a black stone. They, they opened this box, and here was this unusual artifact. We own the Newark Holy Stones, and these stones were found in a Hopewell mound in the 1860s, and uh, the presumption from finding them was that perhaps the American Indians were had some kind of contact with uh, the with the, the Hebrews, or possibly they were the Hebrews. That's another idea. So, so we have our, the museum has been interested in origins. They took it to uh, some scholars, identified that it was probably some type of Hebrew. They took it to some uh, rabbis living in the area. And upon looking at it, they said yes, they could read it. And it was a complete rendition of the Ten Commandments. They called it Block Hebrew because they had never seen anything written like this. But they called it Block Hebrew. And so then naysayers started picking on Weirich. He was accused of sticking this stone in front of these nine men somehow and being able to hide it and conceal it. Upon examination, mainstream archaeologists proclaimed the stones a hoax, while many diffusionists continue to believe in their authenticity. There has been good points on um, either side for whether they are a first, uh, a first millennium piece of, of artifact or something that was devised in the 19th century. Then it wasn't until sometime in the 1900s. Lo and behold, in Israel, they find, guess what? They found block-style Hebrew. The block style Hebrew was given a name by the experts, Monumental Hebrew, because of the way it was written, long after Weirich. After. Mainstream archaeologists dismiss such findings, in part because scientific protocols and rules of evidence were not followed in their acquisition. Uh, the science of archaeology was really in its infancy at that time. There are only a, p a few people using what we would consider to be even remotely modern methods. But what of the tens of thousands of artifacts found prior to the establishment of these modern methods? Should we ignore these artifacts? They can't say that about the Bat Creek Stone because uh, the Bat Creek Stone was found in the course of an official uh, uh, excavation by the Smithsonian Institution. Okay, then Bat Creek Stone went to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. Uh, they didn't understand it. They thought it was Cherokee since it came from Cherokee country. Uh, they did not realize it was Hebrew. And they published it upside down. And then they threw it in a box in the sub-sub basement of the Smithsonian. And ever after it was poo-pooed until um, some Semitic scholars like uh, Cyrus Gordon came and vindicated it. Uh, Cyrus Gordon, um, he was one of the great uh, Semitic scholars of, of our generation. He talks about um, um, the writings that were found in, in this very area and how he was able to translate those things, uh, translate that writing when it was turned over. We're trying to figure out what type of Native American wrote this, and Cyrus Gordon turned it upside down. He recognized that it was actually Phoenician. Phoenician, this older form of Hebrew, dates to the Old Testament Babylonian captivity and the scattering of Israel. Are there other linguistic evidences that may lend support to diffusionist ideas? As a scholar of ancient languages, uh, I have discovered that there are many symbols in the Mi'kmaq 
that are, the, are very close and similar to those of ancient Egyptian. About 700 BC in Egypt, um, there was a language that was developed or came in that was called Marotic from the kingdom of Moro, which many Egyptian scholars have even called Reformed Egyptian because it's so different than what uh, the standard Egyptian that we know. And these, this Marotic is very close to some of those, the signs uh, of, of the Mi'kmaq. All right, so now we're going to get into this book. I, I found it, and I uh, thought it was very interesting when I found it. And I uh, just definitely want to share with you guys. So it's called A Study in Hebrew and Indian Languages, right? Because we're talking about how the words are so similar, a lot of these. And uh, we already got from all these authors how um, most, of, a lot of these uh, so-called American Native Languages resemble the Hebrew, right? So let's look into this book, all right? This book uh, written by Thomas W. Brookbank. Says here, Rick's College, Rexburg in Idaho. All right, let's get into it. But uh, again, it says, after some introductory remarks, certain words which occur in the Indian and the ancient Hebrew languages, respectively, will be submitted for the reader's criticism and study. They are of character considered with respect to both form and sense, which we believe can hardly fail to command the assent of every impartial investigator as being truly analogous examples all right he's going to show you so many things and if you're really in, you know in, into investigating and doing research and you know and you use your logic you know then, then he's saying you're going to see it you're going to see uh, truly analog analogous examples then to these a large number of illustrations which show identical forms or a striking similarity in form in whole or in part will be added in separate lists they are common property of the language in, my, in hand. There are so many such to be taken into consideration that the probability that more than a small percentage of them are mere coincidences cannot be entertained and reasoned. Okay, he's saying there's so many examples that they, these are not mere coincidences, right? You can't entertain that reasoning, all right? Now, when one considers that the greater part of the North American Indians have had no books of any kind, nor alphabetical writings in manuscripts form, nor in any other for that matter, during long centuries of their history, it is not a marvel that more than a cha chance w word here and there sh should show a Hebraic relationship, all right? In any respect or degree, even if it be conce conceded that 2,000 500 years ago, their forefathers were Hebrews and very deep. All right. In view of past conditions of Indian life, generally one might as reasonably expect, if he had a good sized Russian vocabulary, to find numbers of true analogies and a great many similarities of various other kinds between the Russian and the English languages, comparable to those which these pages will show do exist between the Indian and the Hebrew. All right, he's going to show you. All right, the principal source from which the Indian names and words have been listed together with their stated meaning, so far as they are given, are all right. He's going to be telling you some of the sources he's using. Right, all right. And the first one is Bancroft's Native Races. And if you watch part two of uh, Indigenous American to African American, I read from that book mostly on that video. And Bancroft is a very renowned uh, historian, scholar, anthropologist. All right, native races. Check out part two. All right, so Bancroft's Native Races, etc. Five volumes, the whole five volumes, and it's true. I got, I think, four of them. And yeah, he's just, man, he's telling you the truth how their complexion was, who they were, and what they looked like. All right, that was Bancroft all over the West Coast, especially. Stevens Volumes of Travel, etc. Two visits to parts of Mexico and, uh, and Central America. Prescott's Conquest of Mexico. I also have this book. All right, Drake's Aboriginal Races of North America. We have that one as well. Haynes, the North American Indians. I don't know if I do. I probably do. Catlin's volumes. I have those. All right, we we talked about uh, I believe George Catlin and uh, what he was saying about the Native Americans, uh, what they look like, how their hair looked, like he's scrapping dreadlocks, and uh, his paintings. You just gotta go and see what he drew. Handbook of American Indians, two volumes issued by the government printing office all right so it says the government issues have furnished most of the names of words or words 
Several words that occur in the Book of Mormon are also considered in order to show a relationship between the Nephite language and the Hebrew or the Indian. An example is also taken from the Pearl of Great Price. All right. So first of all, that's great. So we saw that he's using other sources, right? This is not just Mormonism. Right? A lot of people come and, oh, this is, you're a Mormon. All right. All right. Who do you think the Mormons got all their religion, all their info from? The gold tablets they supposedly found in a cave they ran into. Obviously, if they did find a, a gold, uh, uh, you know, uh, tablets, um, I mean, we found that all over the Americas, especially down in El Salvador, uh, Father Crespi's collection and all that. Um, I mean, we, we, we know this exists, so it is possible somebody found some gold place. Whether they ran into them, I, I doubt that. They, you know, they're high degree masons, uh, you know, John Smith's, you know, family and all that, high degree, 33 degree, you know, and above masons. And uh, they probably knew of a legend or something and they found it in the cave, supposedly, whatever, you know, whatever. But um, they created their religion based on the info they had and what they know about the ancient uh, Americans. You know, they knew, they knew who they were. All right. So this is not Mormonism work is what I just want to clear up. Right. So continue says the definitions of the Hebrew words are all from Dr. Robert Young's analytical concordance to the Bible. All right. So you see all the sources this guy's using. Right. On the other hand, the Indians have had but little assistance, save the power of memory to preserve in purity the forms of words and their meaning as their forefathers used them. And as stated before, it is little short of a marvel to find any correspondence between the speech of the Indians and the language of the Hebrews, even allowing that the two peoples are racially a unit. You hear that, right? The evidence supplied of the face of the quoted passages is proof that it does not follow that in cases where both form and sense do not characterize words taken from different languages. The similarity in form is to be regarded as a mere coincidence and nothing more. The most that should be claimed in such cases is that the similarity of form may be merely coincidental. When, however, the number of corresponding forms is usually large, the probability that they all occur by chance is greatly lessened. Further, if it be found that large numbers of similar or identical forms characterize any two languages which are said by com competent judges to be constructed on like principles, we have fair ground for assuming the most of the, l of the like forms are not accidental coincidences and finally if real analogies are shown to exist between the two languages it is evident that they have sprung from a common source and the value of simply similar or identical terms becomes very important as sustaining the evidence supplied by true analogies such are conditions respecting the claim that the indian languages have come from the hebrew okay again such are the conditions respecting the claim that the Indian languages have come from the Hebrew. If there were but few such terms mutually characterizing them, they should be considered of no great value in this matter. But as the case stands with hundreds of similar or identical forms listed, it is not in reason to say that they stand a close second to analogies in support of the proposition that the Indian language had their primal source in the Hebrew Consideration of the two words that have been listed in, is next in order. And the name Utah, okay, we're going to start with Utah, shall be taken up first. All right, it is one of wide use and has been applied to Indians in one form or another in Arizona, Idaho, Oregon, Nevada, and California, that whole southwestern United States. You see how big Utah was, really was. We've got maps that show that. In the western part of the United States, while in eastern districts in a variant form as Utah. All right, you see that? So on the east, we find the word, the same word, but it just spelled a little different. E-U-T-A-W, Utah, Utah. It is used as the name of a town in Alabama. And in 1781, a battle was fought between the British and the Americans at Utah Springs in South Carolina. So you hear that? I know that these springs were sacred land and, and holy places for the American uh, natives. So fighting there, you know, man, I, I'm sure they didn't uh, like that or want to do that, but they probably had to. All right. Utah, Utah, and Utah with the E-U-T-A-W and Ute are names applied to an Indian language. Paiute, Pa, Utah, and 
peak Ute literally mean river Utah river example Utah as spoken by certain Indians living on the Colorado River Yampa Utah's designates Utes who live or have lived south of the Uitas 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 now it says here Hebrew all right so let's see if we can understand this all right so it says jam is a Hebrew form which among other things means south okay we got that from who UB news right UB news thank you for the uh, perspective with the compass and the direction right and the oh, and the what it really meant in, in Hebrew, in ancient Paleo Hebrew. So it says here, jam means south, right? Here we have an example where a Hebrew word has a correspondent in both form and sense in Indian speech. All right, so he's saying that we just got right, jampa yutas, jampa, so southern Utah. <laughs> jam is a Hebrew form, which among other things means south. Here we have an example where a Hebrew word has a corresponding both form and sense in Indian speech. Further, we find in Hebrew the names Utah, Utah with a with J U T T A H. We're gonna address that J though. Jatba and Jata. And according to Dr. John, Juta and Juta. All right, so before we continue, just you know, remind you we're just talking about Utah, right? So look at this. So take away the U J what do you have you have Utah take away a T that's Utah right so it says Utah pronounced Utah with a Y is a town in Israel identified with modern-day Jata so that's the hijack Jata as it says here Utah right was a Levitical city in the mountains of Judah or Utah named in connection with Sif, Jezreel, in the neighborhood of Maon and Carmel, it was allotted to the priest. So it was a Judean town or city, Utah, Judah, right? And we're just talking about Utah, right? Or from Spanish, what? Utah, Y-U-T-A. So just add a T and you get the same name as in the Bible. Name of an indigenous Udo Aztecan people of the Great Basin, perhaps from Western Apache, which is Judah, 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 hi, in reference to living in the mountains. Living in mountains? Wait, let's go back. Utah extended a Levitical city in the mountains or hill country of Judah, living in the mountains. People living in the mountains, Utah, Utah, Levitical city, right? Joshua 15, 55 says here, or 21, 16, its modern name is Judah. It is supposed to have been the residence of Zacharias and Elizabeth and the birthplace of John the Baptist. And on this account, it's annually visited by thousands of pilgrims belonging to the Greek church. But, all right, so we're letting you know. So if you're looking for the residence of Zacharias and Elizabeth, you know, you got to go to Utah. All right, Utah, Judah, living in the mountains, Levitical city in the mountains. It's, Again, according to Dr. John, Utah and Utah are either of them pronounced as if spelled Utah with a Y, he says. Now, turning to the name Jotba, which is found alphabetically in place in the body of the concordance, we are there told that Jotba is the same as Utah, an ancient town in Judea. Whoa! Utah, an ancient town in Judea now called Jata, <laughs> which is no faraway variant of Jata or Juta, Juta again, what we got to get up here, Juta, Juta, look at that, Juta, all right, the meaning of Jodba is given as excellent for water, excellent for water, and we know that whole area right there was very watered back in ancient times, all right, we know they're building dams and they're, you know, making deserts, you know, creating deserts and, you know, stopping the flow of certain rivers. But that whole area there was was watered, well watered. We know the Salt Lake. We know there was an ocean there. We know we got the Utah Lake. We have reference to that being the Sea of Galilee. All right. We got the Jordan River. We got a lot of water actually under Utah. We're going to get into that. All right. So, again, 
excellent for water. All right, Jotba, which is the same as saying Juta or Juta. All right, other proper Hebrew names spelled with initial J in English should also be pronounced as if their first letter was Y. And why is that? Because there was no letter in the ancient Hebrew alphabet that English J is the equivalent of. There was no J's. All right, so what are we talking about here? There is no J's in Hebrew. All right, we're talking about Jehovah, Shawa, not Jesus. All right, and for this reason, Dr. John authorizes the change in the form and the pronunciation of the words in hand. In about 300 examples of biblical Hebrew proper names, which are spelled in English with initial J, our learned Hebraist authorizes the substitution of Y for J. Oh, so he authorizes it. But we already know there's no J's in Paleo Hebrew. And we're going to see that Y is not even, you know, that came a little bit later as well. All right. We have more of Wa, Wa, Wa. You know, the Wa, Wa instead of the Ja. Right in the pro in this proper form, Jata, Jata, Juta, and Juta are close variants of one another. Juta, Juta, Jotba, and Jata all being names applied to the same place. All right, these are all the same, and thus evidently having the same meaning. We see how appropriately this state has been given the name which it bears, namely Juta which as already observed means excellent for water, all right? Within its boundaries, there is a large inland sea. Inland sea, there's a large inland sea. We're talking about a dead sea, right? Inland sea, several fresh water lakes of fair size, many smaller ones, while a number of rivers are fed from its mountain ranges and numerous small streams course down its canyons and make fruitful the rich soil we're talking about Kemet, rich soil, black soil, rich soil, doesn't mean a specific location. Of its valleys and when the very excellent quality of its drinking water is taken into consideration. Also, who can think of a more appropriate name for this member of the American Union than Utah, which is short for excellent for water? At present, white people and likely Indians also use the name Utah without reference in a single instance to its ancient meaning. But it is evident that the Hebrews in Judea thousands of years ago had it. All right. It's evident. With So they had the word Utah is what he's telling you. And it was a city that was basically a place, an excellent source for water. All right. With an inconsequential difference in orthography, and then gave it to gave to it a meaning which makes it so remarkably fitting to advertise in a single word certain natural conditions or resources of great value with which Utah is blessed. It is remarkable that the Indians have preserved the ancient form of the name in what is essentially purity. All right. All right, so before I continued, we were just talking about Utah, right? We saw what it meant. Excellent uh, for water, right? Excellent water. Uh, place with excellent water, right? So it says here, Department of the Interior, United States Geological Survey, Charles D. Walcott, Director, Underground Water in the Valleys of Utah Lake and Jordan River. Jordan River, Utah. Underground water, all right? Excellent for water. We're not making any of this up, all right? This is written in 1906, all right? So it says here, look at all the uh, contents. So it says here again, underground water in the valleys of Utah Lake and Jordan River, Utah. Jordan River, all right. The valleys, well, it says this is by G.B. Richardson. It says the, va the valleys of Utah Lake and Jordan River are situated in north central Utah in the extreme eastern part of the Great Basin. The lofty Wasatch Range, the westernmost of the Rocky Mountain system, limits the valley on the east and relatively low basin ranges. The Okir Lake and East Tintic Mountains determine them on the west. The valleys trend north and south and are almost separated by the low east-west traverse range. 
the slopes of which constitute a dam for Utah Lake, which drains through the Jordan River to the Great Salt Lake. Again, all right, so let me explain this. So we've been able to uh, see a lot of correlation with the Utah Lake, uh, the Jordan River and the Great Salt Lake, uh, meaning with the Sea of Galilee as the Utah Lake, the Sea of Galilee, because the Sea of Galilee actually also drains if you go to the biblical uh, verses it drains uh, you know th from the jordan river to the dead sea the dead sea right a salt sea well it does the same here in utah right so it goes from the utah lake uh, the jordan river to the great salt lake it enters into that just like in the biblical uh, scripture that the jordan river does as well from the sea of galilee to the dead sea the area under consideration is the most populous and flourishing part of the state. Salt Lake City and Provo, the first and third cities in the state, and many other thriving settlements are there located. At Bingham Junction and Murray, a number of smelters treat the ores from nearby mines, but agriculture is the main industry. Water for irrigation is supplied by mountain streams and intensive farming is successfully pursued. The practice of irrigation was begun by the Mormon pioneers in 1847 and has been discussed in several publications. Little attention, however, has been given to the underground water resources. Little attention. Uh, you think it's a desert over there, right? And Condrop, you know, thank you for uh, putting this perspective uh, into us and letting us know how in scripture it tells us, right? It tells us that, you know, these dry places will be fertile, will, be, will have water again springs will come out again you know it's a promise all right so we know in this ancient land utah judah right deuteronomy 34 we know now you know it's called excellent for water there's a town in judea that was called utah jata excellent for water and we know now that in underground water resources here in utah right there's a lot and so far as the writer is aware they have not before been described the present paper outlines conditions of currents of the subterranean waters and describes their development in the valleys of Utah Lake and Jordan River. All right, so this book, I mean, I'm not going to read it all, but, you know, it goes into a lot of detail on this. You can, I'm going to leave the link there. So, I guess this is the Utah Lake. This is what the uh, Mormons are calling the Sea of Galilee. And it does make sense because we can see that the uh, Jordan River goes this way, right? See the mouse into the Great Salt Lake up here or the Dead Sea, right? We know we got Moab and Nebo all around here. So we know we know we, these are, uh, you know, biblical lands. We can see Cedar Valley. We know about the Cedars of God and Lebanon, place of whiteness. We know Aslan is in Utah. You know, Aslan is the uh, mythological uh, place, uh, origin of the Aztecs, the Mexica. And it also means place of whiteness. So we all, we are putting the dots together, fam. So we got to just, you know, know this and we got to keep researching, you know, we got to help each other and, you know, whatever everybody, anybody finds, you know, share it with everybody else so we can, you know, get this going, you know, a lot stronger, get the correlation, get the evidence recorded. All right. Put it all together. Yeah. So a lot of research in this book, <laughs> it de definitely shows how much water is underneath Utah, just waiting to spring up, waiting to water the valleys here. And this, this uh, drawing, this map shows here, it says explanation, area in which groundwater lies within 10 feet of the surface. Within 10 feet, all this, uh, you know, these lines, look at all this water around Utah Lake. All right, and it says area in which groundwater lies deeper than 50 feet below the surface, deeper than 50 feet. And it says base of mountain approximate position of the Bonneville shoreline. So this is, this is the old ancient lake called Bonneville that was here. There was two ancient lakes here. And I think the last one was the Bonneville one. And I'm not reading the book, but, you know, here's the, uh, the diagrams and maps. There's another one. Great Salt Lake, it says here. Williams L, Salt Lake City. And you see this uh, diagram where uh, it says here, area in which flowing wells are obtained. So anywhere on these, you can get wells. You can dig a well and get water. Whoever has land here, you know, has good land. You know, they can get water, fresh water. Base of mountains is the approximate position of the Bonneville shoreline. Wells, direct wells the record of which are shown on plate five so there's a well here i guess all these dots there's wells all over these dots all right all right so again we're in the book back a study in hebrew and indian languages by thomas brookbank and what does it say utah which is short for excellent for water 
All right, Utah means excellent for water. Was this an Eden? Was this one of the original Edens? Was it the original Eden? All right, so isn't it beautiful how we do some, you know, all this correlation like this? You know, we weren't ever looking for stuff like this, but when you start going into it so deeply like this, you start seeing how everything starts fitting together. I right. the history of the uh, American Indian, and it says here, particularly those nations adjoining to the Mississippi, East and West Florida, Georgia, South and North Carolina and Virginia, containing an account of their origin, language, manners, religious, civil customs, laws, form of government, punishments, conduct in war, domestic life, their habits, diet, agriculture, manufacturers, disease and methods of, of cure and other particulars sufficient to render it a, a complete Indian system. With observations on former historians, the conduct of our colony governors, superintendents, missionaries. All right, so this is written by James Adair Esquire, a trader with the Indians and resident in their country for 40 years. All right, James Adair lived with them for 40 years with your observations and arguments in proof of the American Indians being descended from the Jews. All right. Again, we're in the book, A History of the American Indian by James Adair. A number of particulars present themselves in favor of a Jewish descent. But to form a true judgment and draw a solid conclusion, the following arguments must not be partially separated. Let them be distinctly con considered, then unite them together and view their force collectively. Argument 1. As the Israelites were divided into tribes and had chiefs over them, so the Indians divide themselves. Each tribe forms a little community within the nation. And as the nation has its particular symbol, so has each tribe the badge from which it is denominated. The Sakem of each tribe is a necessary party in conveyances and treaties to which he affixes the mark of his tribe as a corporation with us does their public seal. If we go from nation to nation among them, we shall not find one who does not lineally distinguish himself by his respective family. The genealogical names which they assume are derived either from the names of those animals whereof the Sherubim are said in Revelation to be compounded or from such creatures as are most familiar to them. They have the families of the eagle, panther, tiger and buffalo, and the family of the bear, deer, raccoon, tortoise, snake and fish, fish, fish sorry. And likewise of the wind. History of the American Indian by James Adair says, Argument number two. James says, By a strict permanent divine precept, the Hebrew nation were ordered to worship at Jerusalem, Jehovah. Dodge the hijack, right? With the Jehovah, the B's, and all that, and the J's. We didn't have that, all right? Paleo Hebrew, more like Jehovah, right? Hawa. And the true and living God. And who by the Indians is styled, what did I just say? Jehua, Jehua, look at the Hawa, Hawa, Jehua, which the 72 interpreters, either from ignorance or superstition, have translated Adonai. Right? So they're saying they, they got from, you know, from Jehua, they, they translated that to Adonai. And he's trying to say, how the hell did they get to Adonai from that, right? And it's the very same as the Greek kurios, signifying sir, lord, or master. So he's saying that Adonai really just means sir, lord, or master. It doesn't mean, you know, the most high, which is commonly applied to earthly potentates, all right? This is only applied to humans, all right? Title, these are titles, without the least significance of or relation to that most great and awful name of Hawa, which describes the divine essence who naturally and necessarily exists of himself without beginning or end. The ancient heathens, it is well known, worshipped a plurality of gods, gods which they formed to themselves according to their own liking, as various as the countries they inhabited and as numerous with some of the days of the year. But these Indian Americans pay their religious devour to Lok, each to Ho, Abba, the great beneficent supreme Holy Spirit of fire who resides, as they think, above the clouds, and on earth also with unpolluted people. He is with them, the sole author of warmth, light, and all animal and vegetable life. They do not pay least perceivable adoration to any images, all right, no images, or to dead persons. 
just like the Hebrews, neither to the celestial luminaries, all right, no falling angel doctrine, nor evil spirits, nor any created being whatsoever, created being, that's not from the Most High. They are utter strangers to all the gestures practiced by the pagans in their religious rites. So who was the pagan, right? They did the Papa Bull and the, and the Pope said, you can go over to America and get all these pagans, right? These Saracens, these pagans, these enemies of Christ and take their kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, their land, their territory, their titles, right? Now, who really is the pagan? Because James Adir is telling us there is no uh, practice, you know, no gestures practiced by pagans in their religious rites. They kiss no idols, nor if they were placed out of their reach, would they kiss their hands in token of reverence and a willing obedience. You're hearing this, right? The ceremonies of the Indians and their religious worship are more after the Mosaic institution, Mosaic, Meshach, Moses, right? Deuteronomy, Leviticus, then a pagan imitation, which could not be if the majority of the old natives were of heathenish heathenish descent for all bigots and enthusiasts will fight to death for the very shadow of their superstitious worship when they have even lost all the substance there yet remain so many marks as to enable us to trace the hebrew extraction and rights through all the various nations of indians all right again there yet remain so many marks as to enable us to trace the hebrew extraction and rights through the various nations of Indians and we may with a great deal of probability conclude that if any heathens accompanied them to the American world or were settled in before them they became proselytes of justice and their pagan rites and customs were swallowed up in the Jewish from the book Anaka Lipsis an attempt to draw aside the veil of the Sadic Isis or an inquiry into the origin of languages, nations, and religions by the late Godfrey Higgins, Esquire. Volume 2, 1836. And we're going to go all the way to uh, chapter 4. And it says, chapter 4 is, uh, it says here, Lord Kingsborough on Mexico. Malcolm, Mexican mythos, the same as that of the old world. Again, Mexican mythos the same as that of the old world where is the true old world which one is the duplicate again you see it's not my theory this is what scholarly uh, research is leading to the mexican history gives us a long account of their arrival in mexico from a distant country far to the west the stations where the colony rested from time to time during its long migration which took many years are particularly described and it is said that the ruins of the towns which they occupied are to be seen in several places along the coast. I think it is evident that this migration from the west is merely a mythos. The circumstances are such to render it totally incredible. In principle, it is the same as that of the Jews, but accommodated to the circumstances of the New World. Again, the migration stories of the Mexicans, right? He's saying the Mexica, the Mexics, Mexica, Moses, Mexi. In principle, it is the same as that of the Jews, but accommodated to the circumstances of the New World. It really seems impossible to read Lord Kingsborough's notes on page 241 and not to see that the mythos of a chosen people and a God conducting them after long migrations to a promised land, attributed by the Spanish monks to the contrivance of the devil, was common to Jews, Christians, and Mexicans. I think it seems clear from page 186 that, that Mexico or Mexi, Mexico, Mexico, Mexi, Mexi, Moses, Moshe was the Hebrew Mexi. Again, this person is saying what we've been saying already. Thank you, Drop Nation. Thank you, Con Drop. Mexico was the Hebrew Mexi. Then it would be the country of the Messiah, Mexico. The country of the Messiah, the Meshach, Meshi, call. Or it might equally be the country of the leader whom we call Moses, of the people whom we have found in Western Syria. Again, Mexico, named after the country of the leader whom we call Moses. All right. Again, this is 
from a different source. We're getting this, but we've been correlating already. His lordship shows that the word Mesitli or Mexico is precisely the same as the Hebrew word Messi or Messi or anointed. And that one of these gods shall sit on the right hand of the other. Page 82. In the next page, he says the full accomplishment of the prophecy of a savior in the person of Quetzalcoatl. Again, the accomplishment of the prophecy of a savior in the person of Quetzalcoatl, Jehoshua, has been acknowledged by the Jews in America. He says, page 100, the temptation of Quetzalcoatl, the fast of 40 days ordained by the Mexican ritual, the cup with which he was presented to drink, the reed which was his sign, the morning star which he is designated, the tepalt or stone which was laid on his altar and called teotekpalt or divine stone, which was likewise an object of adoration. All these circumstances connected with many other relating to Quetzalcoatl, which are here omitted, are very curious and mysterious. But why are they omitted? by his lordship the pious monks accounted for all these things by the agency of the devil and burned all the hieroglyphic books containing them whenever it was in their power ever since european colonists began settling in the land that would later become the united states of america many artifacts have been discovered which suggest that one of the ancient native american mound builder civilizations which the U.S. calls Hopewell, are descendants of Hebrew people who migrated to ancient North America during the 500s BC, which is approximately the earliest estimated dates of the Hopewell mound builders in Florida, Tennessee, and Iowa. Yet there have been many people in the United States who insist that every single one of these artifacts are fake. My personal opinion is because it opposes the idea that nobody sailed to America before Christopher Columbus. But there's at least one extremely large piece of evidence carved right into the landscape near Fayetteville, Ohio that can't be denied as solid evidence of Hebrew people in ancient North America. And you can see it right on Google Earth. But before we get into that, just a brief introduction. The Hopewell Mound Builders built hundreds of thousands of structures out of various types of earth materials. These structures included burial mounds, animal effigy mounds, forts, temples, and advanced geometric structures with lunar and solar alignments. Many of these structures have been leveled down and destroyed as the United States expanded west and built itself right over them. But some still exist today. Early U.S. settlers would create detailed survey drawings of some of these structures. There are a few good books which were published by the Smithsonian in the mid-1800s that show detailed survey drawings from the Ohio and New York areas. They're called Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, Aboriginal Monuments of New York, and Antiquities of New York. But there was a one-of-a-kind mound builder structure that was unlike all the rest at least as far as I know. In 1823, Major Isaac Roberdeau of the United States Army Corps of Engineers created this survey drawing of a massive earth structure just southwest of present-day Fayetteville, Ohio. Notice the Hebrew oil lamp. Notice the nine candle menorah. And notice other ancient and sacred symbols such as the compass and the square. Another drawing of this structure is included in one of the Smithsonian books I mentioned earlier, Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. And still, there are some who insist that this survey drawing was fake and that the structure never even existed. Unfortunately, the United States Army Corps of Engineers completely destroyed this structure in the early 1900s and leveled it into flat ground. But why? Was it an intentional attempt to erase this odd Hebrew structure from American history? Or was it simply out of carelessness and lack of respect for ancient American antiquities? I don't know. But here's the good news. They missed a spot. And you can see it right on Google Earth. 
Here's a satellite image of the area where the structure was said to have been located. It's just southwest of Fayetteville, Ohio, where the 131 and the 50 intersect, and it's all just farmlands and trees. Do you see the spot they missed? There it is, right there. The Hebrew letter Shin, or Sim. And it's okay if you didn't see it, I didn't see it either until someone pointed it out to me a few months ago. Now some of you may be saying, wait, but that's not on the survey drawing. And you're right. So I wonder if that's why they missed it. In 1823, that whole area was probably covered with thick forest, and who knows for how long after that. Perhaps still in the early 1900s when they leveled it down. So what we're looking at here are massive ditches that include the Hebrew letter Shin, or Sin. I'll leave it to you to research the significance of this letter, but it's a very sacred letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The history, the history that has been erased in our nation, and in particular with the Native Americans, happened because it didn't fit the story they created, Manifest Destiny. It only works when Indians were savages, and they had to have savages for commerce and government to expand. The ancient artifacts prove otherwise. Why aren't we looking into those? Peter